Okay, uh, welcome. Welcome to the Medell Music Festival. I'm Peter Knopp I'm on, and I'm your host for the first hour now. Uh, this is the first uh, of a series of experts online today that will deal with uh, sound and music perception across all areas that have somehow to do, uh, especially in clinics, with cochlear implants. Um, and the first experts online is about exactly that sound and music perception with cochlear implants. We have three really uh, world top uh, scientists and clinicians as our guests in this first hour. We'll start with some Mentimeter questions. Mentimeter is, uh, is a portal that allows you, that allows online polls. And you are seeing the, uh, the instructions here. You either go to www.menti.com and type in the code that's shown on the uh, on the left bottom corner, 2291729, or you scan the QR code on the right side of the slide, and then you are then you are redirected to the uh, respective uh, Menti page directly. So please enter Mentimeter now. And then the first question is just in order to let everybody know who's there, what's your background? Just type in your, your work title, so to speak. Surgeon, audiologist, whatever. Uh, speech therapist we have. Right, okay. Go on typing. There is still a hundred responses missing. Okay. Okay, so it's mostly or the main part is audiologists, then speech therapists. We also have a medical student uh, I saw, clinical engineer, um, coordinate audiology, uh, speech pathology, speech pathologist, music therapist, very welcome, very welcome. CRI, CI rehabilitation. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is rather related to the topic. Have you ever been asked about how music sounds through a CI? And it's just yes or no. And it's just to see whether there is people out there that did never come across this question ever before in their, in their professional life. Okay, so most people have been asked about how music sounds through a CI, but interestingly, there is a still, there is a small, but still there is a number of people uh, that have never been asked so far how music sounds through a CI. Okay, now if you belong to the first group, to the yes group here, then our next question is, and that's the final question for the Mentimeter, what was your answer? Please just type in a short text, one word, two words, three words, just a short phrase that, that describes what, was, what, what your response was, like, I don't know, or different, different for everyone, yeah? I don't know, right? That's a very that's a very honest answer. I wouldn't know. Different from nature, different to normal hearing, but can be learned to be appreciated with practice. Very true. It's artificial like computer noises. We'll see. It takes time and rehab to appreciate music. Uh, probably a bit electronic. It needs practicing. I don't think I can tell without having a CI. <laughs> uh, well, that's what I sometimes think. I should get implanted, then I would be a better CI developer. Music sounds different with CI, different for all, changing over time. We can train music listening if you want. So that's more an offer than an answer. Music won't sound like it used to. Uh, depends on hearing history, varies, uh, varies, some users love it, 
some don't, not like normal hearing, different for everyone. I think all of those responses are really perfect. I would say they're all valid responses. I think I think uh, listening to music with a CI is very diff difficult to predict. Uh, and by the way, as a scientist, as I can say, it's also very difficult to measure. For young children, very natural, without timbre, huge flanging effects, different for everyone. Different, but you will enjoy. That's a really interesting comment. Uh, it's really interesting. There seems to be some discrepancy between what deep, what, how people describe their music listening and then how people describe their enjoyment. It doesn't, it doesn't really seem the two are very strongly connected. Okay, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your help. Okay. Okay. Um, so for the first half hour, we have really three distinguished speakers with us. Uh, it's really three of the top uh, scientists and CI clinicians in the world, uh, Professor Paul van der Henning, Professor Margaret Dillon, and Professor Michael Dorman. Uh, we start with uh, Professor Paul uh, van der Henning, who is the uh, Professor Emeritus uh, at the, uh, at the um, Department of Translational Neuroscience at the University of Antwerp. Now, for private reasons, Paul can't be with us today, but we've produced a recording that we will be watching uh, and where he's giving his talk. So can you please start Paul's video? Dear audience, dear colleagues, why is apical stimulation, stimulation in the second turn of the cochlea beneficial for music appreciation. That's what I try to show in the next presentation and at the same time explain the rationale for long cochlear implant electrodes. Nature has provided several cochlear terms, but in traditional cochlear implantation, only the basal turn is used with electrodes of 24 to 25 millimeters length arguing that deeper stimulation did not improve the auditory capabilities. So we've conducted, and several other colleagues and centers, a series of experiments to evaluate and to find out what the effects are on auditory capability of stimulating the second term. Let me start immediately with the main message and results. For your patient with cochlear implantation, to perceive low tones in a clear way, under 300 Hertz, you can only achieve this by stimulating electrically with electrodes in the second term. And also important to stimulate these electrodes at rates following the fundamental frequency of the signal. That means if the sound is 100 Hertz, the stimulation rate is also 100 Hertz. We call this the frequency following stimulation. And why is this important for music? Low tones are really essential for rhythm and prosody, as well in music as in speech. First, on the structure that we stimulate, it are the spiral ganglion cells we stimulate. And the cells extend in the second turn of the cochlea. It's thanks to the excellent work of the group around Sumit Agrawal from London, Ontario, and Rask Anderson, Uppsala, Sweden, that we have these nice pictures where it is clear that 25% of the spiraling ganglion neurons, and this is the end or apex with a bulb of neurons in the second turn, that 25% are located between 400 degrees and 720 degrees. So well 
within the second term, and this is in contradiction what initially was said that the neurons only extend in the basal term. But it is not true thanks to this innovative research, and it is also proven by histological sections in pathological cases. And if we stimulate this, what do the people then and patients perceive? For that, we used a particular type of patient. It are patients with a normal hearing in one side and a deaf ear in the other one in which a cochlear implant was, was provided. So the patients then can compare what they hear from the normal ear acoustically with what they hear through the cochlear implant in the deaf ear. In the first approach, we stimulated each electrode from the implant, and we asked the patient to adapt the frequency, the pitch in the normal hearing ear. So we get this pitch matching procedures, and the result you see first at the left panel, this is the localization of the electrodes, the insertion depth localization of the, uh, the electrodes. These are the electrodes in the first, the basal term, these are the electrodes in the second term, and this is the perceived pitch. And when we stimulate electrodes in the second term, we get lower tones than when we stimulate them in the basal term. And Rader and colleagues refined this experiment by using different stimulation rates. In this experiment, all electrodes were stimulated at 1500 hertz. But in this experiment, he applied this frequency following stimulation. So he calculated with the Greenwood function, the appropriate frequency of a particular electrode, according to its localization in the cochlea and stimulated it accordingly. So it's an electrode situated at 600 degrees insertion depth was stimulated, for instance, at 150 hertz. And then we see that there's much less variation in this low tone pitch perception, and that even lower tones are perceived when you combine second term localization with low pitch stimulation. What is the effect? on noise, speech in noise, and on music appreciation. On speech, this is probably the best experiment ever done, prospectively randomized by the team of Professor Dillon, who will speak after me. And it is clear that patients that were implanted with a long electrode, and so with a deep insertion in the cochlea, and using this frequency following stimulation in the apex, give better results than using medium electrodes, also with apical frequency following stimulation. And these results of this cohort, of this prospective cohort, were reassessed four years later and showed stable, better results of the standard electrode from 31 millimeters over the medium electrodes of 24 millimeters. In another group in our center, we adapted the initial cis fitted patients with standard frequency range by extending the frequency, low frequency range application in these patients in two ways, also with the cis stimulation rate on these low tones or with the fine structure. And we found that after one year and especially after two years, the fine structure processing, so with the frequency following stimulation on the apical electrodes, outperforms the one with cis standard 1500 hertz stimulation. And music. This study of Roy and colleagues assessed the sound quality 
in the y-axis is a score of sound quality and the lower the better. In the x-axis is the insertion angle of the apical electrodes and he used two types of electrodes, the medium medal array of 24 millimeters and the standard medal array of 31 millimeters. And so again, the red dots here from the apical stimulation is clear that they are at a higher insertion angle than the medium electrodes and they outperform clearly in music quality the medium length electrodes. Moreover, they found out that the threshold at which the music quality deteriorated was when the bass frequencies were removed under 200 hertz. So it is essential for music quality appreciation that patients perceive frequencies under 200 hertz. So we come to a conclusion. Clear low tones under 300 hertz can only be perceived by cochlear implant patients using electrical stimulation in the second turn of the cochlea. In fact, it's the apex of the spiral ganglion and using frequency following stimulation. We know that they are essential for rhythm and prosody and we have to apply programs like Otterplan to have precise cochlear size measurements to make the appropriate choice. But in the majority of the patients, the Flex 28 will be the appropriate choice. I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. We're back. Uh, that was Paul uh, van der Henning's uh, talk about how important it is to stimulate the second turn of the cochlea because there are structures that can be stimulated and exploited by a cochlear implant, so to speak, and how this uh, then improves uh, both speech perception and music appreciation and also uh, pitch perception if you stimulate at the correct uh, rate in the cochlea. And that leads us directly to our second speaker for today, which is Professor Margaret Dill. She will, uh, she will talk about um, pitch perception for cochlear implant users with single-sided deafness, mapping considerations. Professor Dillon is uh, Associate Professor and Director of the Cochlear Implant Research Program uh, at the Department of Otolaryngology at the School of Medicine, University of North Carolina. She's a well, very well-known both clinician and CI scientist in the United States. Uh, Meg, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, good morning from North Carolina. Excited to be a part of this discussion and share some of the things that we've been working on um, and thinking about with our clinical and research teams at UNC. Um, I'm going to be sharing some data from a clinical trial that we conducted with patients with single side deafness or moderate to profound unilateral hearing loss um, and their pitch perception within those first couple of months and then how that's motivating what we're thinking about now when it comes to device selection and mapping. First, I'd like to acknowledge our team at the University of North Carolina. You'll see that um, these data are part of a very large study that cannot be done in isolation. So it really is this collaboration between researchers, physicians, audiologists, speech language pathologists. And we're so um, thankful for all of our trainees that also work with us and support these projects. <laughs> so we know that um, the general cochlear implant signal coding follows the tonotopic organization of the cochlea and in a very general way. So low frequency information is distributed to contacts that are in the apical region where and high frequency information is distributed to contacts in the basal region. So we're trying to take advantage of this tonotopic organization of the cochlea. And um, these are all general and we're not really thinking about electrode array length 
um, differences in co cochlear morphology, some of these variables that can influence discrepancies between the frequency information that we are presenting and the natural cochlear place frequency. And we refer to those differences as frequency to place mismatch. Um, and we have wondered how important frequency to place mismatch is on a cochlear implant patient's pitch perception and also their speech recognition. Um, Dr. Vanda Heining in his lecture referenced a study that we did a few years ago where we randomized patients to receive either a long electrode, the 31.5 millimeter array, or a shorter electrode. And we followed them over the course of a year and did some measures of speech recognition. And these were conventional cochlear implant patients, so moderate to profound sensory neural hearing loss in both ears. And what we found was that the patients that received the longer electrode array did better faster than those that received the shorter electrode array. And we think that's because with that longer electrode array and the default filter frequencies, we were better approximating cochlear place and that made it easier for patients to understand what was being presented faster. Um, and then a few years later, we looked at the data for that cohort out to four years and saw that those differences in performance were being maintained. So that made us think that this is more important than we may have thought previously to provide frequency information closer to the cochlear place. Um, and when we started to implant patients with single side deafness or moderate to profound unilateral hearing loss, we thought a lot about what electrode array would support the best monaural performance, but also binaural performance. And in our clinical trial, we decided to move forward with the long electrode array only in these cases, with the thought being that we're better approximating cochlear place, and that could support better performance in both the monaural and binaural hearing conditions. So in our clinical trial, um, we had 20 subjects, and of those, 19 um, elected to participate in a project where we were evaluating pitch perception. And our aims were to assess the accuracy and acclimatization of low frequency pitch perception in cochlear implant recipients with single side deafness. And again, all of these recipients received the long 31.5 lateral wall electrode array. Um, we also compared their ability to use electric fine structure cues to resolve this low frequency pitch information. So 19 participated in this study. Again, they all had moderate to profound sensory neural hearing loss in the affected ear with poor speech recognition. Um, the contralateral ear importantly had normal to near normal hearing thresholds from 250 to 8,000 Hertz. They were all implanted with the long lateral wall electrode array from MedL, and they were mapped with the FS4 signal coding strategy with default filter frequencies applied. And that was at the time 100 to 8,500 Hertz. Um, something to think about with the FS4 coding strategy is that on those four most apical contacts, they're providing temporal fine structure information. Whereas on electrodes five through 12, this is our continuous interleave sampling or CIS strategy, which is envelope only information. So we were interested if applying this temporal fine coding information in that apical region where we think we're better approximating cochlear place, was that a benefit for these patients and on speech recognition measures, but for this particular task on um, pitch perception. So what they did was we were using the clinical program software and we were stimulating at 80% of the dynamic range and they heard these 300 millisecond bursts through the clinical software that was presenting on individual contact. And there was a gap in between each of those bursts. So they're hearing this pulse coming from their cochlear implant. And then when they were ready, they would hear an acoustic um, stimulus in their contralateral ear. And it was either a pure tone or a click train so that we could look at differences in um, the perceptual similarity to what they were hearing with the cochlear implant. And their task was to say whether this acoustic stimulus was higher or lower in pitch relative to what they were hearing with the cochlear implant. And this was a two alternative force choice pitch comparison, so two interleave tracks. And we would do this two down, one up, two up, one down procedure until we um, reached a threshold and would take the geometric mean from those two to have what the threshold was um, for that particular contact. This was assessed at one, three, six, and 12 months post activation. And then at the 12 month interval, we had nine subjects that elected to repeat the task 
while listening to um, CIS or HDCIS. And so the big difference here is now we've taken away, presumably, those temporal fine structure cues on those four most apical contacts, and they are just receiving envelope information alone. So the aim here was, again, is there a benefit of having that temporal fine structure cues on those low frequency channels or on those apical channels relative to providing envelope information alone? And so here are those data. And first we have at the one month interval and then at the 12 month interval. Um, these are the apical electrode contacts. So E1 is the most apical up to E5. Um, importantly, again, the fine structure information is being presented on E1 through four. E5 is a CIS channel envelope only. Um, and then we have normalized pitch. And that is um, the match frequency that we are attaining with the task divided by the center frequency of the specific channel that we are evaluating. Um, so in that case, a one would indicate a match between what's being presented and what they are perceiving. And that one is indicated by this dashed line here. Um, so we have the results from electrodes one through five. The individual results are plotted over top the box plots. Um, and what we can see is that we're pretty close between what is being presented and what is being perceived. Um, but importantly, that there's not this evidence of acclimatization between the one month and the 12 months. So they were perceiving pretty early on close to what we were presenting um, within that initial couple of weeks of listening experience. And that's maintained through that 12 month interval. And then here we have the data from the comparison at the 12 month interval with FS4 versus HDCIS for those nine listeners that repeated the task. Um, again, we have electrode number on this axis with our most apical electrode to our, um, electrode five, which again, for um, the FS4 coding strategy is envelope only information, also with the HDCIS strategy. We then have normalized pitch here and our um, line here indicating a match between what is being perceived and what is being presented. Um, the open boxes are for the FS4 coding strategy, temporal fine structure information provided. Um, and then the filled boxes are CIS, so um, envelope only information. And what we can see here is that it's fairly similar for E2 through 5, but on electrode 1, we are seeing a difference between the pitch that is being perceived when temporal fine structure information is being provided versus when it's not. So offering this additional piece of information in that apical region is causing um, the patient to perceive more frequency information than what could be perceived with a CIS strategy alone. So the conclusions from this study were that low frequency pitch perception did not change significantly between the one and 12 month post activation intervals. And this could be related to minimal electric frequency to place mis mismatches provided by the long electrode array when using the default filters. Also that pitch matches on E1 were more accurate with FS4 than with HDCIS. And we think that this is the benefit of applying both place and rate cues for pitch perception. And these data have um, motivated us to think, can we get better with what we are providing patients? So we can put in the long electrode array and we can get close to cochlear place frequency, but we have seen that there's still variability and, and discrepancies between what was being presented and the cochlear place frequency. So we still have frequency to place mismatches that could be inter interfering with pitch and also with speech perception. Um, and so now we are using interoperative um, and post-operative imaging to modify and individualize the filter frequencies for patients to see if we can improve it even further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meg. Thank you very much. Um, so what we've heard so far, really in, 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 in one sentence, is that it is beneficial to stimulate the apical region of the cochlea, and it is beneficial to then, in addition to stimulating at least close to the correct place in the cochlea, also at least for the low frequencies, uh, then stimulating using the temporal fine structure, uh, which then in, 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 in conjunction, the two uh, together really improve the perception of low pitches uh, and thereby then also, as Paul has shown, uh, music perception. Now, the last speaker today, Professor Michael Dorman, really has then done a fascinating study in recent years where he uh, investigated the effect of stimulating various places in the cochlea through long or short electrodes 
uh, on on um, on sound perception, and that is on sound quality that's produced by CI. And that's really the uh, that's the topic of our last uh, presentation today. Before we go into the discussion, uh, Professor Dorman is the professor emeritus. Uh, at the College of Health Solutions uh, at Arizona State University. Uh, Michael, please. Well, thank you, Peter. Let me get my slideshow up. Okay. If our patients are to appreciate vocal music performance, then, of course, voices have to sound right. They have to sound like uh, they remember the singer. So that uh, a male voice needs to sound at least male and not female. And female voices need to sound female uh, and not childlike. Now, both of these problems can occur if electrodes aren't inserted as deeply as possible into the cochlea. And in the next few minutes, uh, I'll explain the data that supports this claim. The data come from work we've done with single-sided deaf patients fit with a cochlear implant. This is work like uh, several others have done. So we implant or we insert a signal, a clean signal to the CI ear. Now, critically, we know that's processed by two different processing systems. A left hemisphere system for speech understanding, speech recognition. This is what we commonly study. But there's also a right hemisphere system that's involved in voice recognition. Who's talking? How tall are they? Uh, what's their gender? Um, how long is their vocal tract? And the anatomical substrate for this is on the right superior temporal uh, solstice shown here in dark blue. And I emphasize these are very different processing systems, anatomically separate. So uh, all the uh, 50 years of research we've done on speech understanding may or may not uh, apply to voice recognition. We'll have to see. So after we've injected a signal into the CI ear, then we make up signals for the normal hearing ear. And we distort uh, a clean signal in a way that might sound like an implant. And then we hope one of these signals we make up for the normal hearing ear sounds like the implant. And we work with our patients in an interactive fashion. So if the patient says, no, that signal you make up for the normal hearing ear is too low, then we increase the frequency until the patient says, yeah, that's pretty close to what I hear with my implant, but you're missing something else. And then we add something else. And again, we work interactively to have the guide, have the patients guide us to what the closest match possible. Now we've been at this for about a decade and we've now uh, get pretty close to the sound of an implant for many or perhaps most patients. What we found is that one factor that is relevant to the voice of an implant, only one factor, there are several, is electrode insertion depth. And the issue here, uh, as other speakers have suggested, is that electrodes generally do not extend to the tip of the apex. And for that reason, input signals are delivered to frequencies that are higher than the input frequency. Well, let me show you some data from patients with 28 millimeter electrode arrays. I've plotted the spiral ganglion frequency at the most apical electrode for some 15 patients. And you can see that uh, at best, the most apical electrode uh, for this patient is a little over 200 hertz. So if you inject a 100 hertz signal, it'll be going to something like the 200 hertz place relative to the spiral ganglion frequency. But for patients over here, uh, that 100 hertz signal will be going to the six or 700 hertz place uh, relative to the spiral ganglion. 
and we might expect that signals would sound upshifted. <clears throat> now, if we have a shorter array, an 18.5 millimeter array shown here in red, then of course the electrodes don't um, uh, are not as deeply inserted, and they fall in this very small sample between six uh, and 900 hertz. Now, it's possible to get an idea of what an upshifted signal would sound like if that were the only issue, and it's not the only issue. But if it were the only issue, uh, I'll play an original sound. Do you like camping? One more time. Do you like camping? And then I'll shift the whole signal up by 200 hertz. And I think this upshift is the basis for the Mickey Mouse percept or other kinds of funny percepts uh, our patients uh, report. Now then, this spiral ganglion frequency can be offset by a lower pitch match. So here I have uh, plotted the spiral ganglion frequencies for some 15 patients for E1 through E4. Let's look at E1 now, which is uh, the most apical electrode. And again, uh, the most apical electrode sits at about the 200 hertz place at best, but it might sit at the um, six or 700 hertz place. If we ask patients to match the pitch <clears throat> of electrodes, as uh, Professor Dillon uh, has suggested to you, we can get data like this. So that the pitch matches uh, commonly can be lower than the spiral ganglion frequencies, and in fact can be reasonably close to the input frequency. So here I've, I've made up a little mystery for this morning. When we have patients match the sound of their implants, will they match more or less by spiral ganglion frequencies, in which case they'd all be upshifted, or will they more likely match to uh, the pitch data, in which case they will not sound upshifted? Well, let's see. So here, I show you again uh, data from uh, 28 millimeter electrode patients in blue and 18.5 millimeter patients uh, in red. Now let's look at the match to the sound of a sentence from this patient here with the spiral ganglion frequency at the most apical electrode near 300 hertz. And at issue again, is whether the match will sound upshifted or not. So first I'll play you the original. I like to play tennis. And now the issue, I'll play you the match. And the question is, will it sound upshifted? Will it sound funny? I like to play tennis. No, it sounds very much like the original. Now I emphasize that not all matches are this close to the original, but I, it is the case that if the electrode is inserted this deeply, then we commonly don't get upshifts in pitch or voice timbre. Now, let's look if the electrode is inserted uh, less deeply into the cochlea. So we have an original. Do you like camping? And here's the match. That sounds upshifted. Here's another original out at around 700 hertz. Do you like camping? There's the original. And there's the match. So I'll go back. Original. Do you like camping? And the match. That's clearly upshifted. So to summarize, um, it appears to be the case, or it is the case, that with a sufficiently deep electrode insertion, even if relative to the spiral ganglion, it should be a little upshifted, uh, the voice 
sounds reasonably close to normal pitch and resonance. However, if the uh, insertion angle is greater than 500 hertz or so, and uh, that number will move around, I know as I have more patients in the sample, um, if the insertion angle is, uh, or if the spiral ganglion frequency is six or seven or eight or 900 hertz, then it's very likely that voices will sound upshifted in pitch and in voice timbre. So the best chance we have to get something close to normal pitch and normal resonance or timbre is to have not only a long electrode, but to have that electrode inserted as deeply as possible into the cochlea. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers, Paul, uh, Meg, and Michael. Now it's time for you out there to ask questions. If you have any, please type in your questions, uh, enter your questions into the chat. Uh, any questions, uh, anything that possibly more or less related to what we've heard. Uh, I'll just repeat again. Um, the deeper an electrode is inserted into the cochlea, the better the chances to get to something like normal sound quality through a CI. And that chance is maybe even enhanced uh, to some extent. We then even provide fine structure information on the most apical electrode contacts. Uh, please, we have Professor Hagen from Würzburg here. Please um, okay. unmute yourself. Yes, welcome. Can you hear me? Yep, yes, we can. First of all, uh, um, great thanks to all of the speakers. It was really three great talks. And for me, it's somehow a sort of revival of complete coverage as Medell proposed it for many, many years. But what I was a little missing was really the topic music. Music, can you understand me? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the main um, examples were on uh, speech perception. Does it sound more natural or not? What about, do, do we have to think if a deaf child receives a CI, it has a completely different development of music perception. So I think there, is, there are two different groups. Children who were born deaf and receive a CI bilateral within the first year, they may develop a completely different music perception than, for example, people who had normal music perception and got deaf during their lifetime. This is maybe we have to differentiate between these two groups. But my question to Meg and all the others, what do you think about the anatomical based fitting? Because in bilateral, we often see there is some mismatch and we go further into the details uh, to have the electrode stimulation in the natural place, maybe then possibly the music perception could get better. So I think um, you bring up a couple of really important points. So I would emphasize that the data that I shared were from adults that all had um, short duration of deafness, single side deafness before getting a cochlear implant. So that is um, an important consideration, especially as we're thinking about the difference of what could be perceived for children versus adults. Um, our experience with, um, so I don't believe um, anatomy-based fitting is um, available yet in the US. However, we have been doing a research project um, with something very similar where we are using the inter interoperative x-ray or post-operative CT to um, match the filter frequencies to cochlear place for low and mid frequency information. And then we are logarithmically aligning the, uh, or logarithmically assigning the high frequency information for basal contacts. And the motivation for that um, was primarily for speech recognition. So you also brought up difference between speech recognition and music perception, um, mostly because the aim of patients getting these cochlear implants is to improve their speech recognition and because appropriately measuring music perception is 
quite the challenge. And we've been, you know, looking at the work of Kate Gefeller and also um, Charles Lim and Melanie Gilbert, the things that they're doing to see what are really the most appropriate tasks to measure um, music perception when we're thinking about something that could be fairly subtle with changes in filter frequencies, depending on the electrode array you're choosing. Um, now, I will say our experience with patients that we have switched the filter frequencies um, to match their cochlear place have been interesting, um, one for, for speech perception, but also for music perception. And most recently, we had a long-term bilateral adult listener, he had seven years of bilateral use, um, switch to these what we refer to as place-based filter frequencies. And his motivation was to improve music perception. Um, and what we saw was that at first, even though he had been implanted with a long array, these filters were not very different from what he had with the default, um, was that it sounded strange to him, which we could expect. You have long-term listening experience with certain filters that you make any sort of shift, it's going to be different. Um, but he did report um, an improvement in his music perception. And that's been something that we've been trying to see how can we objectively capture some of those um, because his speech recognition was amazing to begin with and he had excellent binaural hearing abilities as well. And so we saw some modest gains there, um, but his big benefit that he took away from it was for music. So I think you're right that getting it right to cochlear place could be really important. May I ask a second question? Can, can, can I, sorry, Professor Hagen, can I just first, just briefly yes, refer to, uh, to something we have in the chat? Um, and and that, that goes to uh, Dr. Dillon again. Um, does UNC share information uh, with musician and music working patients pre-surgery about the potential of long electrodes? And does it appear to make a difference uh, with respect to what manufacturer uh, or array they use. Um, so, so are you seeing any effect on, apart from the, from the case that you've, uh, that you've told us about us so far, are you seeing an effect on your clinical uh, results, on your regular patient base, so to speak? I would say our clinical team is still very conservative in um, their counseling of music perception because we're, we're not measuring it. So we don't have the objective data to see, is there a difference when it comes to music perception? But when a cochlear implant candidate comes in and they're saying, I would like to also have an improvement in music perception, then we are very cautious about what that could be like, because there is so much variability in what outcomes are when it comes to music. Um, especially if it's somebody with a lot of low frequency hearing, we talk about the combination of what that can contribute to music perception. And so that is part of the discussion. Um, but generally our patients that um, are reporting the biggest benefits, and again, this is all perception that we are seeing, right? Everybody's perception of music is different, um, is that um, those with hearing preservation and so listening with a combination of acoustic and electric stimulation are EAS users, um, but then also those that have these longer electrode arrays mm -hmm. um, are reporting the benefits for music. Some of them are even saying that they will listen to music um, via their cochlear implant um, when they're in certain situations um, because they find it enjoyable. Now, I would say that's the minority and maybe it's just, we're getting better with the way that we're representing this frequency information. Um, it could also be related to experience that they have had with music, auditory training that they're doing with music, but all of these things are still speculative at this point. Okay. So I would, to answer that question in a more succinct way, I would be cautious in um, advising a patient um, about music perception still. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Um, scrolling to, through the, uh, through the um, uh, chat, I'm seeing that there is a number of questions that are related to fitting and rehab. Uh, I will not take those questions right now. We are a bit short in time. The next um, experts online right after this will be about fitting and how to improve uh, music uh, by fitting better or differently. And the next after the next um, um, expert online will be on rehab and music. So please uh, uh, place those questions again 
in an hour or in half an hour at the next or the one after the next uh, um, 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 experts online today. I just would like to ask a final or link on a question that has been asked uh, or the, a, a, a remark that has been made by Professor Hagen uh, and relay that to, uh, to Michael Dorman. Uh, you talked about the, well, the speech brain and the music brain. Do you think that that the argument that a, 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 a congenitally deaf child will learn to appreciate music through a CI regardless of what the child had before because it didn't have anything before anyway so that the design of the CI basically doesn't make it doesn't matter because that child hasn't made any natural hearing experience or do you think that's going too far? I suspect it's probably uh, true. Mm -hmm. That is to say that uh, we know implants get the signal um, pretty close to what it should be. And uh, if there is no pre-existing template uh, for sound quality, then um, it's reasonable to suppose that there's nothing to overcome. Uh, nothing will be out of place because you don't know what the right place is. Uh, certainly children that we've worked with um, listen to music and, and uh, say they listen a lot to music. Um, now, the problem of uh, finding out what that sounds like to them uh, mm -hmm. is difficult uh, when we have done work with children, even, even children five, six, or seven. Uh, it's difficult to get answers out of them that you believe. When you ask, does this sound like your implant? While they're willing to say no, if it's really different, uh, they're willing to say yes to a lot of things. And, and I, we, we started out working with children because we thought this was a really interesting problem. Uh, and, and in the end, we weren't convinced that the data were reliable. Okay, okay. Okay, so more research needed. Um, thank you to everyone. Thank you to our three speakers, Paul Thunderhanning, uh, Margaret Dillon, and, and Professor Mark, Michael Dorman. A special thank to Professor Dorman. It's five o'clock in the morning in Texas. So really also a special thank to Margaret Dillon. It's a bit later at you in, in North Carolina. It's a bit more humane in North Carolina. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the audience. Thank you for staying tuned. And do stay tuned for the next experts online on fitting a cochlear implant for optimal music perception. Thank you very much and goodbye.